um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time out to join us. And um, it gives me immense pleasure and mild envy to introduce my friend Nishan. Uh, to put us in uh, perspective, we are all uh, PT's batchmates, so so that's easy for us to place ourselves. Uh, Nishan graduated from uh, DC in 2008, and after a successful stint with Maruti, he then accomplished his master's from TU Delft in the Netherlands in 2013. Then he was a consultant in Barcelona and Paris till his return to India in 2014. Since then, he has a great tenure starting the Godrej Innovation Labs and handing it over uh, in uh, 2019. And since then, he, he has been an adventurer, which he was at heart even before, and he has extensively traveled across Ukraine, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Armenia, and Georgia. I guess uh, that makes almost the whole of Caucasus, which, is, which I think is quite exclusive choice for places to be. Currently, he's in a very intense time of his life uh, and moving things at breakneck speed. He just became a father six months ago. So effectively juggling two babies, his daughter and his startup. Of course, to which uh, having an inspiring life partner helps. They recently moved family from Mumbai to Paris in January this year. Nishant is the CEO and co-founder of a Paris-based startup, Lomads. Lomads is building tools and services using Web3 blockchain technologies for communities to better govern themselves and create value. To, for example, uh, imagine a group of amateur filmmakers who can eventually uh, evolve into a self-governed production company, being able to raise funds from supporters, reward contributors fairly, and share the benefits equitably with their supporters, all done seamlessly over the decentralized web technologies, of which most of us know frighteningly little. So why don't we learn about what it takes to build a startup in Web3 from the man himself? Mm. Over to you, Nishant. Wow, Kingship, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, very, very formal, but thank you. <clears throat> so, so, <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, Dada, I thought I'll split my presentation um, like depending on you know uh, what the audience feels today, I can touch upon the technology uh, where it is today, and also share. There is also a personal journey behind it, you know, as a startup founder, uh, you know, what decisions one takes and how it evolves. Uh, so I think these two parts I will try to uh, briefly cover. <clears throat> so so just uh, to get a sense, like how many of you. Uh, have uh, already read about or have uh, read about Web3 blockchain or have a wallet, uh, like just want to get a sense. Anyone here, Ritesh, the... okay. A little bit. Did today. A little bit, okay, okay, okay. Okay, good to know. Uh, yeah, that, that is important, you know, to, uh, uh, to that's how I, I'll try to, uh, yeah shape my presentation. So TK, so I think the best way is to uh, start with real examples. <clears throat> and one example already, you know, King Shuk just referred in the, uh, uh, in, in his introduction. And uh, so imagine that, and this has happened actually uh, in my startup, that there was a simple group of filmmakers and uh, they were doing self-funded short films. Uh, and uh, that was a small project, but as they became more successful, more people joined and their ambition also uh, grew, uh, you know, that to raise more money and to make uh, better films. So, so now this is where, you know, blockchain really comes very handy uh, or Web3, where you can easily raise funds by, you know, uh, release, uh, releasing tokens. Uh, and then the supporters, since they hold the tokens, you know, they kind of also become shareholder in your whatever you are doing. And um, and then you can also use your tokens to really govern the whole community, you know, by rewarding people for meeting deadlines, by rewarding people for, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, spending more hours and so on and so forth. So whatever is required. So I think this is one of the applications of blockchain is this token-based uh, economy where you can use the tokens to govern uh, by rewarding people for certain behaviors and you can also raise funds. So now you think that there is no central entity the money flows, you know, in the treasury, everybody can see how much money has come from the supporters. Now, uh, each of the production people who are there, they can raise proposals uh, that, you know, this needs to be done and people can vote on it and automatically the money will be, uh, you know, uh, going out based on the uh, parameters. <clears throat> so that's one application, uh, for example. Uh, example. Uh, one more, uh, let me give uh, one example through Prakthini, uh, I mean, the Prakthini Association itself. So here, the aspect of transparency comes to my mind could be interesting that today, uh, you know, we transfer the funds to uh, a bank account and, and then, you know, like certain gifts are bought for uh, teachers and staff and so on and so forth. Uh, so, but, you know, the whole idea of banks uh, and bank account is all that it's a centralized system and the bank guarantees the truthfulness of you know the transaction but when you come to a decentralized web3 uh, network then it will be like all of us you know contribute the money and all of us can see the balance and then there are these smart contracts that you know uh, can be that every year let's say if there is 50 uh, let's say 1 lakh rupees uh, you know 20000 rupees will be released and uh, <clears throat> so that's one part that everybody can the smart contract uh, you know all automatically releases the fund for whoever is uh, responsible for spending it and then actually you can trace it that you know if the 20000 is to be distributed amongst the non teaching staff then as they take out the money you know it will be recorded that okay each one was supposed to get 1000 and uh, you know it's just recorded on the whole blockchain so the technology behind it is you know everything is open and transparent uh, you know all transactions uh, all activities are recorded maybe all of us don't need to see it but let's say uh, if you if somebody wants to investigate something that it has been done properly or not then you can see the whole trail of the transactions. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, it can also make other use cases simpler, which we don't uh, think today. Uh, let me give one more ex last example, then I come and explain the technology in more detail. <clears throat> that like, well, maybe we have heard of this term digital nomads, you know, or even my case, you know, I was in Mumbai, and then Paris before that I was in Netherlands. And actually I have not been able to decide where I should buy an apartment, you know, uh, because now even in, if I live in Paris, maybe I can live for three years, but should I buy an apartment? I don't know. And I think there are many people like me, you know. So imagine a company, you know, which says that, okay, we are gonna have uh, uh, these 20 properties, co-living spaces and, you can and and you know like the whole ownership is divided into one million tokens and you can buy your share of ownership so basically i can buy a certain number of tokens to own a piece of all the 20 properties spread across the globe uh, you know and then i can have passive income from them as you know people uh, come rent those properties and uh, you know um, uh, and it flows to me uh, or I can also go and live in those properties. So I think this whole part of, you know, earning from the passive income can also become automated without all those banks and things, because you can write that smart contract, which says that, okay, from each of the properties, the money which is coming, and it will be distributed among the token holders based on their holding uh, structure. You know, if I hold 1000 tokens, then I get 1,000 by 1 million, uh, you know, of the earnings uh, after you divide it. So all automated, but it's just that it's today happening more in the token, then you have to reimburse, you have to pay your taxes. But, but you know, like, this is another layer, you know, level of, uh, uh, I would say, value exchange, and it's becoming much simpler. And, and this is uh, slowly coming. So now the question is, why many of you don't know about it it's very obvious you know like that every new technology you know it goes through 
a curve, a cycle. And so you would have first, let's say, I will just share a screen if it's possible. Mm -hmm. Open system. Well, screen sharing could be tough, so let's just uh, skip that. So, you know, think of it as a curve and different types of uh, people. So there are innovators, there are early adopters, then early majority, then late majority, and then there are laggards. So imagine there is a bell curve. And so we are right now at the innovators and early adopters of the technology. So, you know, it's, it's very much like, uh, you know, the hush hush, you know, it's, it's uh, the user experience is uh, not uh, as evolved as, you know, a lot of people will find it easy. Things are changing very fast. So the technology is, is, is you know, in early stages. So it's more about those who are really uh, passionate about it or just somehow got initiated by someone, they are into it and developing it. But yeah, as more and more practical applications are built, you know, people will start using it. And that's why I thought that, you know, I'll start with three examples of application rather than just going and talking about technology. Uh, yeah, I think this, this uh, house ownership example is also super interesting. Imagine how much of paperwork we have to do. And, <clears throat> but it will be very simple and it will again be read, uh, written, uh, you know, on, on, um, on the web, you know, visible to everybody that this transaction took place and this guy did it. So that's what uh, blockchain technology is. Now, let me take a, a step back and try to explain a little bit about what's happening and how this is uh, becoming a reality. So, so the, the meaning of blockchain is that it's a chain of blocks and each block has information and the next block will have some kind of cryptic code to have all the information of the previous block and the new information. So the thing is, first of all, you cannot, and, and for each block, there are several com computers, you know, validating that the information is correct, okay? So, so the thing is, it's very hard to tamper with it and, and it's possible to keep everything in open. So what happens that this, the, the, the chances of fraud is, is like almost, uh, uh, neck, uh, nail, I can say, because if you, uh, if you know, because it's all distributed and all the different computers save the data of the previous block when a new block is created. So it's not that when you create a new block, you will try to tamper the data from the previous block, you know, and this is all happening in the code. So, and that is why it is, it is possible to have uh, all these financials, uh, financial transactions going on uh, without uh, having the need of a central entity because uh, you can run a program to find any discrepancies, uh, you know, or a program can automatically reject uh, uh, somebody trying to do scriptless things. So I think this is a big change uh, which is coming and a lot of uh, experimentation uh, is, is happening. So, so one of the things is, yes, this greater transparency and improved traceability. So you can really trace back, you know, in the example of uh, the Bractini money, uh, you know, I, I explained that, you know, how you can really trace that, yes, the money came and as per the proposal, this much came out and as, uh, you know, and then as per again, the let's say smart contract, I mean, uh, you know, it was distributed to all the people. So it's all in the chain. And, and the same kind of traceability and transparency can use in supply chain, whether your coffee is the, the packet, if it says that coffee is coming from Ghana, then is it really from Ghana? Uh, you know, the bar could, could have all the information about the supply chain. Uh, and then I have just loosely used this word uh, smart contract but it is key to efficiency. You know, a lot of things can happen automatically. And uh, as I was explaining in the example of uh, uh, passive income flowing from uh, apartment, uh, you know, the investment which I do in, you know, multiple properties. So it's a smart contract, which just has the rules that, you know, if, uh, this is, uh, if the money is coming, then it has to be distributed like this, you know, and, and money here is the tokens. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, and, and this kind of freedom of flow of uh, money 
is uh, it has made many uh, governments, like all the governments, uncomfortable. Uh, uh, because, you know, first of all, the flow of money itself and the convenience which comes with it, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, the tool is never the culprit, it's the users who are the culprit. The people are using it for money laundering, for speculation and all. And that's why, you know, governments around the world are like cannot ignore it. You know, even Indian government had point of view on it. And recently, even Biden kind of released some uh, framework. So, so this is how it goes. You know, the, most of the things, transactions have happened through some kind of coins or tokens. Uh, but then like people disperse it in, in money because somewhere you are either buying the coin by paying money, uh, some of the primary coins, or you get those coins because you contributed by time, effort, you know, in some way, or you just got it as a marketing, you know, just as cashback kind of thing, you know. So these are the ways you can really get the tokens and the coins. Uh, but then... So as per rule in France, like if you are in cashing token into money, then you pay a flat 30% uh, income tax, uh, you know, on the benefit that you uh, made. So more regulations are coming uh, and all the banks are also working on it in their own way to have different levels of, uh, you know, how much centralization is required. So that's the technology. And, and the other thing which I also referred was the security aspect, because as the name suggests, blockchain, okay, so all the information, all the history is, is written on computer blocks. And uh, so if you try to tamper, uh, you know, the system itself would reject. So just because the power really comes from transparency, because everything is out there open, multiple computers are reading it. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it has a very high traceability. So that's, I would say enough, perhaps from my side, uh, uh, an introduction to uh, what is Web3 and blockchain. And of course, uh, immense amount of uh, information is available. Uh, but often, you know, people explain mostly what is the technology and the details of it. But I think now that you have some examples, concrete examples in your mind, I think it will be easier for you to uh, visualize the applications. Now, Lomads had a very, uh, my startup uh, had an interesting journey. So as someone who has again lived in many uh, cities, I wanted to build a startup which allows uh, expats or people who move around easy way uh, to form new social circles and also to find things to do. You know, not just that I found some friends, but beyond that, I was able to find people with whom I can go tricking, with whom, you know, I can maybe learn something new, learn a new language or do pursue a passion. So, you know, so that was Lomad's 1.0. So we were working with communities and events and it was a platform and application. And, um, but the thing is, it was just launched before COVID. <laughs> Uh, like not launched, but like we started on the idea, let's say in September, October, 2019. And then in March, April, COVID, uh, uh, yeah, COVID came, the storm. And then, you know, off and on, we could uh, test it uh, and uh, do some small tests with small users, uh, with small number of users. So there was always off and on. So we got a lot of also time to really reflect on, um, like if we are making a startup in 2022, is it the best thing to do? Or can we use technology in a way, you know, to create things which don't exist yet, you know, and which is uniquely possible only from 2022 onwards, you know? So using that logic, we came to, which is, you can see that it's like communities, but more serious communities, which can create value uh, and uh, impact, and then the trans, uh, the the exchanges between them, whether it's to reward performance, whether it's to share benefits, um, you know, as in case of let's say filmmakers. So, so that's where we are uh, today in Lomads. So, and, and very special focus. So, we are not into all aspects of uh, blockchain. 
uh, which is let's say it's, uh, tracking the supply chain or you know the coins uh, and uh, building the protocols and stuff no we are focusing on just one small application which is uh, these uh, self-organized communities so to say and how they can uh, really uh, make their own tokens you know to raise funds and use them to govern themselves uh, so so yeah that's that's the that's the main area we are working on and and based out of uh, paris <clears throat> so so that's uh, that's my startup and uh, yeah and i think this this technology why many people find it so fascinating uh, is because it's really at the intersection of uh, you know, not just technology, but culture, econo uh, you know, economics and social sciences, you know, because I'm using so many things here. Uh, so, for example, when I talk about rewarding behavior, it really goes into the territory of social sciences that I have a group, you know, what kind of behaviors I want to shape into that group by the reward system, you know, do I want more people to come to these talks? Or do I want people to, uh, you know, comment on it or write blogs about it? I'm just saying that, you know, like you really have to think about how do you really design the reward system using the tokens for a community so that the goal or the purpose of the community is achieved. So, uh, so that that is social sciences part. Then there is economics part, uh, which is really about which is called the tokenomics. That you know, okay, today I'm the Praktini group will release, uh, you know, will have 1 million tokens, then why should we have 1 million tokens? What should be the pricing of, uh, you know, each of the tokens in the first uh, year and, you know, how it might change uh, eventually over time? So you kind of have to do almost like investment banking, the whole modeling of, uh, you know, that uh, that for your you're kind of building an economy for yourself, you know, where people can buy those tokens, have ownership of it, you know, and get access to special features and so on and so forth. So that economics part is also there, and of course there is a huge uh, te technology uh, involved, you know, because you're writing this uh, multi-layered uh, you know uh, codes uh, for there is mathematical cryptographic, you know, so that. Um, uh, cryptography involved because so that you know people cannot tamper with whatever record is uh, being stored and then there are programs and finally the layer of program which you kind of access uh, as a user so uh, so that's the promise of the technology so that's my first part of my presentation i would say i don't if you have any questions i'm happy to answer it was just i would say dipping the toe from my perspective <laughs> into the technology. In the second part, I can share some of the personal aspects of, uh, you know, running the, uh, yeah, running a startup like this. Bishant, do you want to share a screen? I uh, want it, but I think- uh, Then we'll, Rishna will, will have to make you a co-host, I think then you can share. No, I'm already a co-host, but I think okay. sc sharing screen is, uh, is okay. I can do without it actually. Nishant, I had a question, and this was I, yes, please. I heard a lot that blockchain is very power intensive and not very friendly solution for the environment because yeah, is, is that true? Yeah, uh, it is like a generic thing, but it's not like completely true because the technology is evolving. So, you know, the power consumption actually comes from the fact that, you know, you see that all the new data is being added into the chain, you know, and, and the computers have to really validate, you know, multiple people bid for it that, okay, I'm going to validate that this is correct, the new block, which is added, you know, so several computers will validate and that's how the, that is the price of adding data on the blockchain, okay, so that consumes a lot of energy, uh, you know, and, and having all the data from you know from the beginning of time when it started to today so but then new algorithms come you know and new algorithms come that okay that you know maybe you are just keeping snapshots of data you know and there are fewer data stored or you know in, in kind of validation also there can be new ways of validation so the technology itself uh, is being new chains are coming 
which are less power intensive. I wouldn't go into the details, but uh, it's evolving. If you just Google, uh, you will find it. Thank you. Nishant, I would like to ask, uh, ask a question. Yes, uh, yes, please. Uh, 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 from what I have a curiosity, actually, from what I understand, yeah. uh, what you are saying yeah. is uh, we can consider this technology as one of the uh, currencies also, right? Uh, it currency, is of, currency of exchange because we are giving time and effort and we are exchanging things with each other, things and services, goods yes. and services with each other. So mm -hmm. uh, when I look at that way, uh, the thing that has changed over time is that uh, in, ca in case of currencies, there are national currencies currently, and mm -hmm. for example, rupees and dollar, and uh, we are globally connected now. So uh, there is no go global government in the sense. So what we are doing is we are creating a new currency which you are using as a blockchain technology, a currency which is interchangeable globally. So my question is, if this is a kind of currency and over time government will definitely enter into it in the sense that they will try to control, uh, will there be exchange rate also? I mean, for example, dollar has 75 rupees for uh, 75 rupees for $1. So for certain coins will have exchange rate with other uh, currencies. That is the question. Or how do you regulate that? Yeah, it is actually true even today, you know. Uh, so, uh, so let's say that, uh, you know, like I, I open a club today, okay? And I say that, okay, I have only 100 memberships for that club and I am selling each of the membership and think of those as, as tokens, okay? And I say that, okay, each of the token is today priced at $100. So people buy it, okay? But tomorrow, like now, people hear about all the news that, oh, this is such exclusive club, wonderful things are happening. Then somebody will, let's say, if you have a token, they will say that, you know what? I will pay you 200, rupee, 200 euros, uh, $200 for that. Can I get your token, you know? So the, the price keeps on increasing. And that is happening with a lot of tokens because one of the things is, is this artificial scarcity that you would release only this many coins at a time and this many tokens. And then as the initiative becomes more and more valued as the case of the club that I told you, people are willing to pay more for the same thing. And that's how the price keeps going. And that's how, you know, if you just Google Bitcoin price or Ethereum price, the price of one Ethereum coin is, I think, 2 lakhs 30,000 today. Uh, and, and Bitcoin goes to, I think, uh, 20 lakhs or I don't know. I don't uh, fall, do this speculative uh, trading, so I don't know much about the pricing. <laughs> I feel that I'm more like a builder rather than a speculator. Uh, but, you know, people are speculating, you know, like tomorrow if Lomas is a successful startup. So instead of doing the share IPO, I can do my ICO, uh, initial coin offering, you know, to raise funds. And people who would see promise in our startup, they can buy the coins or tokens of my startup. But I think maybe what you are saying is it's there is no one currency, you know, which is going to, which uh, it, it's hard, it's, uh, which is going to replace like dollar or something. Maybe it can become, but today I won't say the most popular one is just Bitcoin. And, and it has huge, huge, like, I think, I think it's market capitalization is cross trillion. Like uh, Amazon and Apple, these companies took so many years to reach the market capital capitalization of uh one, tri one trillion plus, but Bitcoin today has uh, is reached that uh, very fast, the one a trillion. So people just believe in this technology and they keep spending and there is nobody, you cannot because, you know, you cannot say that this is the central guy, let's ho get hold of him and let's uh, put him under the pressure, uh, you know, put him uh, in a prison, you know, because he's doing something, because it is no currency, you are just, you know, connected through computer nodes and you value this uh, currency, so who is going to tell you? You know, government only says that if you are making profit, just give us uh, some tax. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any, any other question from this application or if you have heard about something and you think that, uh, Ritesta, do you want to add something? If you, because you are also from finance background, uh, feel free to improve uh, what I said or add. 
No, you are absolutely right, uh, Sanjeev. The, I'm not a cryptocurrency investor, but lots of my friends are. And of course, there are lots of literature available online. The basic thing which Nishant explained is uh, supply and demand. If an asset becomes you know, more valuable, for example, Nishant's, Nishant is going for an initial ICO and say, I, I bought one token. And one year from now, the cash flows of Nishant's Lumax, you know, very good. And then Sanjeev, that you are interested in buying that token from me. So good thing about the cryptocurrency, instead of selling one uh, token, I can say, okay, Sanjeev, I will sell you only one tenth of that token and the price would be that. You know? And in theory, you can divide that token into millions of, you know, uh, I'm not an expert, but that's all. And there are various, you can, you can go to Coinbase if you want to invest or see how it works. Coinbase is a, uh, it's like, you can, there are lots of cryptocurrencies in there starting from uh, uh, Ethereum and there is something called Dogecoin, et cetera. And uh, in theory, you can launch your own cryptos because I'm not sure whether in India is still uh, uh, under the purview of SEBI or whatever. But that's, 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 how, that's what I know. If there are other experts here, we are free to listen. No, every, everyone is a layman so far as crypto is concerned. So, <laughs> no, Nishant, one uh, very, I mean, uh, on, if you ask for position, I am a, I am a crypto skeptic person. I don't, okay. uh, the, I don't, uh, uh, I agree that the blockchain technology is foolproof and everything. I also agree on NFT that, uh, uh, I mean, you can value, there's a, there's a great utility of cryptos, but what I really have not been able to understand in spite of reading and talking to some friends who seem to be an expert on this is that fundamentally why should the value of crypto itself go up i mean it's it is it is okay i mean uh, that uh, there should be something underlying that that is wh what is my fundamental question and that is where i i get lost and i feel how how do i like equity shares you know that okay company has so much assets, this is the growth rate and all that. So there's a basis on which you value it and it can go up or down, but you have something to fall back on. Some fundamentals are there. But uh, for crypto, I'm still not able to really convince myself that uh, what is underlying crypto is is, is, is really uh, is its value. So of course, demand supply is there. That I fully agree that there's a, the price goes up if the demand goes up. But uh, why should, what is underlying that value? I'm not able to understand. Okay, so I will tell you. So this is a, <laughs> this is a very, very good question and very relevant. And uh, it really, you know, goes back to what we as humans are and we are not uh, completely rational, you know, and you are talking about demand supply, but you think about art piece, you know, an art piece, how do you decide that a Picasso's art will be worth, uh, you know, uh, 6 million. So in, if you talk about NFTs, okay, and you would see that, uh, I will tell you how it, NFTs are non-fungible tokens and they are for buy, like, you know, tokens which represent a music or an art piece, okay? So think of it as music art piece. Now people are crazy that, okay, for the, for a, you know, image of a monkey, app, a ape, you know, how come somebody is paying $100,000, you know? So actually it's, it's, is the thing, the icon, is that valuable to the person who can afford it, you know? And it's just purely coming from that. And what happens that some ugly pixelated things can have value worth a few thousand euros. Uh, but what is happening is that these people who are buying that, they start feeling that they're part of a club of people who have similar design or aesthetic sensibilities. So, you know, this is the question I also ask that this is a pixelated kind of uh, duck or something. And like, you know, like and this class of, uh, uh, you know, art people are buying, but it's not just the art. Then they maybe create a party out of it. And the people who have the sensibilities, maybe they just come and say that, you know what, finally the techies who have money, you know, we are now, you know, setting the price of the art. And this is the new art, you know, earlier it was the super rich, 
uh, you know, from business background, trading background, you know, who would have art. And they said that Picasso's art was good, you know, because people together agree on the value of that thing, you know, like as humanity, if we hadn't agreed on the value of gold, then what is gold? You know, it's like just a heavy uh, metal. So similarly together as humanity, we have agreed that, okay, this Bitcoin, okay, which is not even visible to eyes, you know, uh, uh, we assign it value. So it's, and as I was saying that, you know, this whole tokenomics and stuff is the really culmination of social sciences, economics, and, uh, and tech, you know, so, so a lot of it is, uh, uh, you know, about like what people believe is valuable. And it has bad name because a lot of people just speculate, you know, yeah. they have no nothing to do with meaning. And, and that's why I said, you know, when I was talking about the price of Bitcoin and stuff, I said that I don't do speculation. I am building with the technology, right? I mean, just to learn about the flow and all, I did some stuff, but that's it. It's not like I'm an investor in the technology. Uh, I'm more like a builder with the technology because, because why I tell you that I believe in the technology. I think those of you who have read Yuval Noah Harari's uh, uh, Sapiens. Yes. So, uh, you know, he really there talks about, uh, uh, talks about like why human beings really could surpass apes and the other creatures, uh, you know, in, the, in their development. And, uh, and one of the reasons he cites is our ability to collaborate. You know, that apes never went beyond 150 or like 50, you know, uh, people community, but we could collaborate at a scale of 500,000, you know, people, let's imagine all of us working for a company, you know, 500,000 working for Societe Generale, and it's just a set of rules which make us collaborate, you know, and, uh, and that, that is really true. And what is happening with this technology is that this, this, uh, human collaboration and value exchange will get another, uh, you know, uh, framework, another technology so that this, this transactions, this collaboration can happen much more seamlessly. And uh, yeah, so that is it. And, 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 you know, each of the communities, they will almost, uh, MacBook uh, will now be used. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, each of these communities will almost uh, act like, you know, micro economies. So, so that's it, you know, like I personally uh, was convinced because I thought that, yeah, this has some potential. And because the previous 10, 20 years of internet was, was mainly solved the problem of information exchange, content exchange. So we really, you know, saw that the content and everything was flowing freely and democratically, you know. So now what let's say happened with, uh, you know, content information, it, it will happen with value. Uh, it will happen with, you know, the flow of money, you know. So that like to me, my mind is the, uh, you know, big uh, shift which is uh, coming, you know. So yeah, it's, uh, that's about it from my opinion. Very, very interesting. And also, I mean, I, while while you were talking, this uh, thought came to my mind. Abhi corporates, mein, this is very popular, reverse mentoring. So I passed out in 1990, you passed in uh, 2001. So probably uh, 11 years younger to me. And we have so much to learn from you. So that's, I mean, it is it is there to see, for us to see ki young person, he uh, straight away gets into technology, understands, uh, delves deep into that. And uh, we are oldies, we learn from you. So it's very interesting. And all thanks to Rite, Ritesh, who brought us all, to, all, brought us all together today. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Balaji. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, if there are uh, any questions, uh, further questions, otherwise I can share a little bit about like just the, some personal uh, recollections of uh, you know running uh, own startup and uh, maybe what I have. It's more like a personal journey, you know. It's wow. like what, whatever principles I have, I think that everybody has their own set of principles. And when I am just talking to you, I'm self-reflecting on uh, what I have done, you know. So 
Yeah. Okay, what's Abhishek is asking, what's blockchain in healthcare? Okay, <laughs> actually India is using it. So it's, it's fun that when before coming to Paris, I took my antigen COVID test and I got the, uh, this thing from gov SMS from Maharashtra government. It actually showed me that it's recorded on blockchain that, you know, my medical history that, you know, there is a identifier and then, okay, negative COVID test, or I had like, you know, so it was, sometimes these things happen silently, you know, people don't drum about it, but, but it was surprising, you know, for medical records, uh, it can be an interesting thing, medical data related, you know, you can uh, have all the data recorded and then you can run programs to draw conclusion on it also. So that is something which comes to my mind, Abhishek, about a medical application. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll see if I can find that screenshot of uh, how government had recorded my uh, COVID test on blockchain. I think in in the Gartner cycle, uh, blockchain technologies is at the peak of uh, inflated expectations. To which next to which will be the trough of uh, disappointment. Because then the technology will, oh, okay, we thought the technology will do so much, but it did not do. And then mm -hmm. it will rise up again and reach a plateau of productivity. So that's what most uh, things that, 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 that we invent. So a phase to aayega ke jab like faith kind of market fit uth jayega. Uske baad it will kind of stabilize. Asa mujhe lagta, of course. Nee, nee, bilkul sahi hai. Or... Or ek fayda kingship 30 plus hone ka ye bhi hota hai ki you get to see some other hype cycles. So, <laughs> mujhe apne recent memory mein do hype cycle uh, maine dekha hai khud. Ek tha IoT, Internet of Things ka. So, Internet of Things ke baare mein lagbhag 5-6 saal pehle like there was a lot of things that everything in the home will be connected. Your fridge will be connected to your uh, you know, shopping list and your, uh, well, I use Alexa and I have a bulb, smart bulb, like in Jitna <laughs> promise tha IoT ka leke, matlab. And uh, there was this study which said that by 2020, there will be 50 billion connected devices and all. So, ye consultants ka kaam hai ki uh, predictions, hype banana. But, but it's not that IoT is gone. You know, like, I still made a drawing room with a bulb that you can control the mobile from the mobile. Light ka color change and, you know, timer. You can listen to Alexa on nursery rhymes. So, I mean, the technology is there. After that, the next hype cup was called quantified self. In which people were wearing wearables and uh, predictions were big. There was a lot of wearables in medical wearables. Uh, or uh, of course walking ka data fitter. So that technology itself is not bad. It's just that sometimes people predict too much and we think that technology is gone. But but as a builder, I think if you just do basic reasoning, ki boss, main life kaise better kar raha hon, matlab, main problem kaise solve kar raha hon. Agar mera ek group hai, to usko ultimately value kya milega? Kya better paisa milega, better governance milega? So if you say first principle reasoning, if you do this, then that, um, that, is, um, that is fine, I think. Uh, rather than hype curve, we will come to the consultants. Uh, <laughs> but I think fundamental problems with the attention. This is again one of my uh, things that, you know, as someone running the company, people keep sharing the article, read it, read it, read But I, you know, generally tend to uh, just ask some basic questions, uh, you know, and, and does it make like common sense? Make uh, Okay. So, yeah, but King should but good observation about this. Good point, you know, uh, it confuses a lot of people, you know. Um, but I, I think because in this circle, we can really talk that, you know, it's fine. As a Niki Kalkuya Katamo Jaiga, my love hype cycle, Ate Jate. Right, right, right. Okay, so uh, so I guess uh, then I'm moving a little bit on uh, just personal reflections of my of my startup uh, journey. Then, right, Kingshik, is it okay? Good point to move on. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nishant, uh, just to yes. if you can screen share your website and you know that would be like good experience for us. You know, not everyone 
may have seen your website and what it's leave a small sneak peek kind of thing. <laughs> I will have to, I, I think, uh, pause, stop. Uh, am I sharing my screen already or not? Not yet, not yet. I will have to, you know, just restart this with Ishta then. Okay. okay, then I find it's okay, then leave it. But you can send the link to her in her chat and people can have a look if it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Not all cool. countries may have all the visuals, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, listen, I told you that, you know, Lomads, uh, there was this 1.0. There was like L, S, L, O, sorry, I'll type it. Yo was our 1.0 version and Lomad's point XYZ is our new version. Uh, sorry, why is it not going? Uh, send to everyone in the meeting, okay. And, and the XYZ is what we are now working on, XYZ. Uh, just the introduction website, you know, which lays the intent. Uh, so what I shared today was like very much what's going, you know, under the water, you only see 30%, but then you are working on the tokenomics that, okay, so if people are releasing coins from our platform, uh, you know, how do we back them, you know, collateral and stuff like that. So there is all these things going on. So uh, the website just gives the, uh, uh, you know, a peek into this, this XYZ, XYZ. Okay. Now about the startup journey, you know, I, I think because of my, uh, like last job, one of the important things about management I realized were the people skills. Um, and uh, that was my learning in Godrich because before that I started as an engineer. It was more about like having fun with peers, you know, solving problems. And then I went into strategic consulting, which is more, a work of you know analyzing the market and stuff and then in Godrich I was managing my own team hiring budgeting so I, I realized that you know this people skills is is very very important and uh, and that's why you know like when Indian parents call sometimes just focus too much on uh, you know results and uh, numbers I kind of feel that these social skills learned while negotiating, while explaining, uh, you know, they are like so, so important. Uh, so, so I think on a day-to-day -day basis also, really how you frame the problem as a, a problem that is showing opportunity or a problem, you know, which is you are blaming people. Uh, I think it matters a lot in motivating, uh, you know, keeping, keeping people. So, so I think this is, one of the very, very important things to uh, how you really explain and frame the things. And then I think what also helps, has helped personally me is, is reflection, taking a step back, because when you are dealing with a lot of people, you know, and there are all these different kinds of interactions happening, good, bad, praise, censor, you know, then it kind of starts to take like, you know, and as a leader, you are not there to make everybody happy. You know, you are there to serve a purpose and there will be oppositions and stuff. So I think that's where, like at Vidya Peet, they taught us meditation. You can just call it reflection, sitting on your couch and thinking about it. I think it just helps you uh, clarify it, clarify things in your head and you remain more situated. And, and there is this thing in startup. It's just a life of uncertainty because uh, because you know you are really into a discovery phase and you are always asking this question that is it the right problem to solve and who are the people or uh, you know who will find this valuable and like how would I make money so you are really trying to answer so many questions uh, you know so it's every day uh, you know that that open-ended thing so I think one has to really learn to ask basic questions like why, what, how, uh, you know, take a take a step back. And I think this has been quite a journey, you know, like if your temperament is one where you can really live in midst of uncertainty, uh, I think one should to choose uh, startups. 
And, and you know, when we speak about startup, there is another caveat also that it can be like really range from someone selling cosmetics to someone, uh, you know, uh, solving a problem in blockchain where it's not clear that who is going to be customers. So I think you really have to check the degree of uncertainty you will be uncomfortable in. And, you know, like King Shook spoke about my travel choices. I, I travel very extensively, but, but that's the thing. I, without knowing the language, uh, without knowing anything, I can step into a territory. You know, this Nagarno-Karbakh is a, is a, what? Is a conflicted territory between uh, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. And it was not in my uh, itinerary. You know, I was just having uh, drinks with a fellow traveler in Armenia, in Yerevan. And he said that he had a very good trip in Iraq and that he should do that. He, he wanted to go to Nagarno-Karbakh. I said, okay, do I need a visa? He said, no, you don't need a visa. If you are in Armenia, you just need to go and they will give you a piece of paper and you go. So in real life, you know, this thing that, you know, I, in my head, I knew that, you know, my passport is an Indian passport, which is not as strong as a, let's say, a, a Scottish uh, passport, but well, we will see what happens, you know. So, so that uh, attitude, which is a part of uh, somehow, well, misadventure or adventure, personal uh, trait, you know, you bring it to your startup. A startup is also like that, you know, you kind of risk uh, so much into it. But then, like, I would say that there is just this positive belief that, you know, uh, you will keep searching, keep searching, you know. So, like, I have talked to Ritishda about my previous idea, and now today I'm talking. So, my job is to just keep searching and evolving till I reach that place where, you know, a lot of people start finding immense value in it. And how fast I can do that. And with how less money I can do that, you know, that's why, you know, in startups, people usually bet on people. Uh, so, so yeah, so I think it's that journey, I would say, of grappling with uh, unknowns and uncertainties and uh, surrounding, uh, keeping the team motivated. And I think uh, lad uh, adds another layer of complexity if you are doing it in France. But I think I had spent uh, enough time in Europe to feel comfortable with all kinds of people. And, um, and yeah, they, in fact, the truth is that everybody shares similar kind of insecurities and similar kind of, uh, you know, aspirations um, with, with some minor, you know, you can correct the degree based on the geography, but otherwise it's fundamentally the same. So that, levels of almost uh, here uh, yeah so this these are some just uh, random ramblings for my startup uh, journey so far which comes to my mind any questions on that i'll be happy to answer <laughs> Okay, Ritishta, uh, King Shuk, it's, uh, if that's... Uh, yeah, uh, so we, have a, we have a question and curiosity. Uh, what is Lomads doing in Paris? Can you give us three examples, how you are bringing the community together, how your technology or a startup is enabling this, and how, how are you different from other startups which, we, which they are doing similar kind of work? <laughs> Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, so Lomas was uh, doing what it was doing was uh, earlier uh, was like a platform for where you could discover uh, communities uh, or groups, or uh, you could also join events which can lead to formation of groups and so on. So <clears throat> So what was what we were trying to do was make it very seamless that on the same platform you can find events you can find different kinds of group on the same platform you can you know chat with them just like whatsapp interface if you are in an event you know it goes to your calendar uh, and if you are let's say in a chat platform in a group of people you can also do voting and stuff for yourself 
but it was all about really re meeting in real world and doing things in real world. And one of the examples that I quoted was, let's say this filmmakers group. It was just like started with a shout out on expat groups, you know, people who were semi semi professional and professionals who wanted to make, uh, you know, short films, they came together, you know, and, uh, you know, right from getting to know each other to writing a script together to, you know, shooting a movie. I saw this whole journey happening in that group, you know, within uh, three months or so. And similarly, we had small business groups who did pop up uh, stores themselves. So like they were like different kinds of groups, right, from those for fashion, for artists and uh, book club. So all this was happening. OK. And uh, so one of the things that we wanted to different do differently was uh, hyper local that if in a big city like Paris with like 2 million people living in the city and 13 million, including the suburbs, uh, like the future city should be a 15 minute city. You know, you should have things to do within 15, 20 minute radius. So what if instead of just having, uh, you know, one book club, you had, uh, you know, seven, eight book clubs spread uh, across the city and you could go to the one nearest to, and if you don't like then well you can go anywhere you know it's like for you a trade off between whether you want proximity or whether you want a certain person or a certain thing so uh, so this, these things we were doing and as i said like but then we started feeling that like the problem of you know ticketing the problem of communication uh, you know communication which is the chat group and calendar these are all you know marginal improvements on uh, you know on the, by piecing to, uh, together the current technologies and and that's when when I was reflecting uh, you know on this I felt that maybe the next big problem to solve is not just you know bringing the communities together but to enable the value exchanges between them you kind of help create these small companies you know organizations and it's not and and interestingly inspiration came from one or two groups you know like who are evolving themselves. Uh, because if you evolve in size, for example, or in the terms of the fund you need, you know, you need better governance. And as long as you are self-funding yourself, it's okay, you know, it's smaller. But like the moment you go to a bigger fund, you want more transparency, accountability, and, and that's what it is. And then as a startup, we also had to think about the scaling. So in terms of scaling, well, the thing is, it can be local, you know, the local chapters, uh, you know, can operate very autonomously, but they can also connect and share information with the, uh, you know, with the, their, uh, I would say similar chapters in other cities and so on. So I think this would be a bigger vision of LOMAD still that, you know, we are working on, uh, you know, these organizations in, in Paris, but we are, also wanting to onboard customers who have multi-city presence and where the local chapters can work autonomously and they can connect globally also. So we used our DNA from LOMADS 1.0 to uh, you know, use blockchain technology to now come to LOMADS 2.0, which is uh, uh, more comprehensive for Ritishta and which is uh, something very, very different uh, and quite unique uh, uh, right now, I would say. Thanks, Nishant. Uh, two things. Um, one is an observation, and the second, uh, no, first would be a question, and second would be an observation. Mm -hmm. For with the Pitt family, I use the mm -hmm. word family because uh, we include present students, Prakthani, faculty, uh, mm -hmm. our management staff, and support staff. And that's with the Pitt for us, are all of them. Yeah. So do you have uh, any advice for? any of the family members who would like to have a startup to choose Paris for this kind of work? If yeah. yes, why? Why not uh, Silicon Valley or why not Bangalore? Why not Hyderabad? What, what is unique which uh, in Paris which took you there? I think yeah. a part of it would be some incubation or something you did some project, but yeah. you'd like to know more about it so that mm. our Duffit family would, you know, in future, if they plan to do something, they can always contact you and say, Nishanda or Nishant, I would like to know uh, if I can come to Paris and do something. Mm. 
Okay. So but this is my long term experience with Paris that generally if you are looking for a superior aesthetic experience, you know, uh, everything in the city is done very tastefully. So like when you walk in the city, you absorb so much that uh, and, you know, by observing everything, the way people behave in a more cultured way that your aesthetic sensibility generally goes up without reading and without uh, you know doing anything even without entering the museum uh, any museum so i think if you are and paris historically was a cultural center of europe uh, you know like uh, since i would say maybe 1200th century or even in 16th i suppose uh, so so you know, and that to an extent uh, still uh, is visible. So if your thing is related to culture and uh, and art and uh, yeah, fashion stuff, Paris is good, but that's only half the story. Here, the tech is also very good. You know, uh, several big companies uh, like, I don't know if you know about Thales, which designs, uh, uh, you know, defense systems, which designs. Yeah, yeah so, so Thales is there. Then, you know, all these companies like yeah, Nestle and all, uh, which like there is chemical, uh, their engineering involved there, uh, their Pasture Institute. So, so I think it's, it's tech wise also uh, quite, quite evolved. Uh, you know, you have, I would say relatively cheaper uh, people and highly talented compared to Silicon Valley and New York, let's say. Then the third point is, you know, one's own comfort and temperament, you know. So like I've been to US and I have US friends and colleagues. I had US colleagues in Godridge also who is working. So it's also about like how you like the temperament. And I feel that in US, sometimes it can be a little superlative and everything moves fast, uh, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's just that like people, how to explain our louder more super like not loud balance and today they will be on this side of the spectrum that this is the thing and tomorrow is gone i think in europe people are much more balanced because uh you know and they are building uh based on their future you know so why europe is about building based on uh, based on their past us is always about the future promise you know because they don't have too much of history uh, so I think what I like about generally about Western Europeans is uh, is their little bit measured and uh, uh, balanced approach. Now this is this is on the fuzzy side. Huh? First two points were more about the artistic sensibilities and the tech uh, tech scene, uh, I would say. And the third point was more about the personal, uh, you know, like how you feel in the environment here, and and I think you know like. France or rather Western Europe, they are the ones which take the case of Amazon, Google, Facebook, like they go unhinged, you know, uh, and they would just like take Indians for a ride. Uh, I mean, like, well, India did also a very good step when they didn't allow Facebook to go with Reliance uh, Mobile, you know, for free. Uh, so, but I think Europe takes the case and that is something which I like, you know, I am not a worshipper of like, pure worshipper of capitalism, you know, I am doing something, you know, which is, which I believe is, you know, has a social connotation. And that's why I cited the example of Sapiens and uh, you will know Harari. So I think that is another aspect of Europe I, I like, and this is also related to the balanced and measured approach uh, in Europe. And finally, you know, like it's food and travel and stuff, you know, it's, it's cool. I think it's, if I have to talk about my experience of working in Delhi and seeing some friends in Bangalore, I think if you just want to make a company, India is good because in India, one of the problems is people sometimes forget that there is life beyond company, you know? And uh, I think I had that realization that there is life and there are finer things and there is also a company. So, uh, so I think that feeling is is very very palpable in in Europe, um, yeah. And I think this these are the things which are important. You know what you want to do with your life, uh, yeah. So I think Bangalore might be cheaper and uh, stuff, but 
you know, the, each place has an has an energy, but you will be get sucked, you know, in two hours traffic jam and, uh, you know, and, and the fierce culture and you, more or less the results outcome will be similar, but but that's not what I wanted. Hope uh, it answers, Ritesta. Yes, Nishan, thanks. I agree with most of the points. Most uh, of it. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> coming to the observation point, and it's, I think uh, for our audience here, uh, you touched upon the 15 minute city, which is very interesting uh, in the sense uh, how, how a full circle, you know, example of a full circle. Basically, uh, Paris uh, mayor and Hindalgo proposed that she wants to make this city a 15 minute city, which means you and I or anyone, say, staying in Bangalore or in Paris, will have good schools, good hospitals good shopping centers within 15 minute walk. So you don't have to, you know, travel miles in traffic to get the basic infrastructure sorted or have good health facilities. And she took this idea from a Colombian economist, Carlos Merono, Moreno. If you Google, anyone Googles 15 minute city, Colombian uh, economist. And basically, uh, then I remembered when I was reading uh, Gandhi's, uh, uh, autobiography, where it touches upon the local republic, the, which he wrote, you know, 70, 80 years back, uh, where he said local republic means a self-sustaining village or economy where people produce the goods and services, which is, which is local, which is accessible to most of the people, and it supports the local community. So from Gandhi, uh, who took, he may have taken ideas from others, it went to uh, Carlos Merono, then Carlos Merino gives this idea to Paris and you also get inspired from local, you know. Mm. Uh, it should be mixed. And I think I feel the same and many of us here feel the same. Like I no longer enjoy or relish going to a chain of restaurant, uh, restaurants, but I prefer to go to a local restaurant run by a family or a small uh, source locally anywhere you can chit chat with the people. They have time to talk to you. So it's not only about food, it's about that local, that whole experience. And many of you may have read my messages or emails in our WhatsApp group, I call it social capital. Social capital is some, is some of your experience and some of your experience doesn't come from New York or Moscow or Paris itself, it's a local because you live there, you talk to the people there, you meet the parents of your kids there or the teachers of kids and that makes beautiful uh, experience. So I think uh, Lomats, Gandhi, Carlos, Marano, Paris, Bangalore, El Sitra, it all comes together, you know, it's, it makes sense. And it's very interesting that you shared all this. Uh, sorry for thinking so much, but it came to my mind and then yeah. I wanted to share it with our with the big family. I'm sure others have much uh, other, other things to add to it. No, that it is that was a great uh, addition actually it definitely <laughs> and, and you know it came so it was almost improvised you know it's uh, uh, you know sparked that idea and you shared like it's, it's great thank you uh, audience any questions or observations or feedback anything like to share no uh, i just uh, like to add that uh, it was a very interesting session and uh, uh, I'm really impressed by the knowledge and application and thoughts of uh, Nishant. Uh, it was a Thank pleasure. You. It was a pleasure today. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we wish you all the best. Uh, thanks, Dada. Uh, King Shuk, uh, if you'd like to uh, end this session with your uh, thank you. Thank and you. Uh, any yeah, other yeah. things you'd like to add, please? Um, right. Uh, Thanks, Nishant, and thank you, Vitishta, for those interesting insights. Uh, because as, as an urban designer, uh, the 15-minute city uh, is, is, is a thing very, very close to my heart. Um, but of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, countering forces at play, so it's not easy. But then, of course, in AD, I mean, that's, I think, one of the uh, fundamental tenets of technol uh, technological innovation that at least in the digital world, we have a uh, more equitable uh, chance. So all the best for Nishtam. And thank you, and, and thank you for, for inspiring us. It, it sets very good 
role models and mm -hmm. not just for, <laughs> for the juniors but but for us as well yep but it, 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 to, to start something is, is an act of courage and yeah and this, this is a highly inspiring thank you here. thanks yeah. <laughs> thanks kingshuk uh, thanks nishant for your time and thanks to all the audience Thank you. for this uh, uh, session this video will we will upload to our youtube website and if someone has missed or they can attend it or they want to share uh, before we end the session uh, i would like to remind that our next adda is on 2nd april by our uh, senior dada called sanjay mondalda he's a 1989 pass out and he is a gastrointestinal surgeon uh, he will be talking about the future of medicine. Uh, today we heard about future of, you know, a little bit of IT and blockchain. So uh, maybe we can ask some questions how blockchain is helping his, you know, medical sciences, etc. Uh, with that note, uh, I formally end this session. That means I will stop recording the session, but that doesn't mean you have more questions and you want to interact among yourselves. Please free to do so. Thank you very much. Yeah, Ritesh, uh, I just want to add something very, the, that uh, we have now the Praktani centenary cups being made at various locations. And uh, we don't want the overseas people to miss that. So somehow we have to find the logistics so that whenever someone is going to uh, maybe UK or somewhere, he carries it with him. And whenever there's a get together, we can distribute it. I mean, the you can get it done there also, but the idea of getting it from India and distributing is, is something special and close to everyone's heart. Yeah. Uh, thanks, so, Dad. I worked that out. Yeah. So thanks Divakar, for sharing Dad. this. Divakar, I am going to Paris, Europe in a few days. Sorry, I don't switch on my video. <laughs> huh? ah, <laughs> possible. We can send a offer. मेरे तरफ से पांच छह कप्स 90 बैच का रखा हुआ है यू कैन टेक दैट हम दूसरा बनवा लेंगे और उसमें कुछ टूट भी गया इट्स नॉट अ बिग डील वो पहले ही कह दे रहे हैं किंग सो थैंक्स फॉर फीलिंग तो ले जा सकते हैं हम कुछ निशांत के मेरे के पास पड़ा हुआ है मेरे बैच का चार पांच ले जा सकते हो हम दूसरा और बनवा लेंगे तो कहां से लेना पड़ेगा भैया गुड़गांव गुड़गांव हम जाएंगे तो गुड़गांव ठीक है हम आपको कांटेक्ट करते हैं फिर हां ठीक ठीक मेरे पास दो तीन और कप पड़ा हुआ है वो पड़ा ही हुआ है अभी तक लेके जमा कर रहा है जरा